Okay, first we've got uh, Tim McCord. Hi, Tim. Uh, Managing Director, Global Head of Equity Products at Chicago-based CME Group, world's largest exchange operator. We have Sam Bankman-Fried. He's CEO of FTX, one of the most aggressive crypto exchanges in terms of launching innovative products. And we have Kevin Beardsley, Head of Business Development at Kraken Futures, which is part of Kraken, which of course is one of the biggest dedicated cryptocurrency exchanges in the U.S. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's go straight to Tim for this first question. Uh, Tim, tell us a little bit, you know, from your perspective, the having. what does it mean to you? And, and maybe what have you been seeing on the CME over the past couple of weeks in the lead up to this event? Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly a notable event, right? I think it's something that people have been talking about for quite some time. And it's something we talked about, you know, prior to us looking to introduce options back in January in advance uh, of this event. But I think what's important to note is our role as the exchange, you know, we're agnostic in terms of the price direction of Bitcoin. But what's interesting to see is we're seeing supply and demand events happening in the marketplace and having is certainly one of them. And, you know, we're seeing the customers respond in terms of increasing their risk management around these events, both in terms of hedging. Uh, digital positions that they may hold, as well as expressing a view. And I don't think, you know, it's an accident today that we had the highest record in Bitcoin futures today, a little over 21,000 futures, about 105,000 Bitcoin. Uh, one year ago, the highest day since May of 2019. And we actually had a little bit under 400 options trade, uh, just about 2,000 Bitcoin, uh, which is also a record since launching in January. So I think events like this will continue to unfold and introduce risk management and trading opportunities for the market participants around Bitcoin and see me as the exchange. You know, we're here to make sure that when they need to risk manage their risk or express their view, they could do so in an orderly and transparent fashion. And I think that's certainly what we saw uh, running up into the this afternoon today. Tim, Tim, you said today was a record for volume in, in CME Bitcoin futures. And, and I'm just that's interesting that, again, it wasn't a big price move today, but it sounds like a lot of people were really trading. Yeah, it was a record for the options uh, today since launch, uh, but on the okay. future side, not a record, but notable. It was the highest volume day in over a year, just about one year, uh, doing over 21,000 futures uh, compared to the ADV of this year, which is only about 8,500. So almost 3x the average daily volume for 2020 was put up and today. And what, what do you make of that, Tim? I think just in terms of, you know, when there are events happening in the market, you know, Bitcoin is not unique in that regard as events are happening and the marketplace needs to express a view or manage risk and discover that price, they could do so at CME. And I think with a lot of the activity we were seeing over the weekend going into today, as well as the halving occurring today, there was just a lot of price discovery that needed to happen and a lot of risk that needed to be transferred and people were able to do so fairly easily at CME. Hey, Kevin, what about you at uh, Kraken Futures? What kind of activity have you guys seen in, in connection with the halving? Yeah, first of all, thank you all very much for having me here today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think in terms of the halving itself, I mean, people will trade the price. The price went up a little bit and then it went down a little bit and it will go up or down tomorrow. I think what really matters, though, is the broader narrative that this is in a, in a world where governments are printing money in a world where you're having unprecedented um, finance sort of fiscal uh, policy happening, you have a sort of counter narrative going on with Bitcoin where you have a supply constraint. And I think it's interesting that it opens up the conversation to many, many more people because ultimately if, the, if crypto is gonna grow, it requires more people to become aware of it and become interested in it and, and want to learn about it. So um, I think the having is much more interesting as a broader macro narrative rather than what the price did this morning. Great. And Sam, at FTX, what about uh, you? What what kind of activity did you see leading up to the halving? Yeah, so, you know, I, I mean, certainly in the, uh, you know, I'd say in the couple weeks to month before this, we saw a lot of buying, and it's just true everywhere. Um, and, you know, sort of is reflected in the, the fact that Bitcoin's price basically doubled. Um, it, it also seems like, like probably it was a little overplayed. Um, this is not shocking. I mean, you saw the same thing in the run up to the initial listing of the CME and, and CBOE uh, Bitcoin features and a number of other events where I, uh, you know, uh, with sort of the rise of high leverage derivatives, 
uh, the world was able to place this bet when it wanted, and, and it seems like the world placed this bet over the last month, and, and maybe placed it, you know, about 125% the size it wanted to, and then took took 25% of that off, uh, you know, over the last few days as as prices fell back, you know, 15% or so from their peaks. Um, and, and, you know, things seem to be settling somewhere in the, you know, mid-8,000s. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, obviously. Like, that doesn't mean that's what's happening long-term. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the story of, of the last few days has been, uh, you know, price fall and, uh, and sort of uh, stabilization uh, around this range as some people take off, uh, you know, pre-positioning that they had on. Right. Um, okay. And then I, I wanted to jump away from the having topic for a little bit because one of the, the, the big news in, in the past few days was the, the Paul Tudor Jones story of him going into into Bitcoin. Um, so I wanted to start with with Kevin on this. You know, it's hard to get kind of hard data on whether institutions are 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 coming to crypto, uh, but this is one anecdote that you know some of them are. So what are you hearing from institutions? Do you see increased appetite? Yeah. So up until now, there's always been a pretty firm line between who's involved and who's not. And that line has to do with, are you managing the money? So is it your money or are you managing the money on behalf of somebody else? And up until I think the last couple of days, if you were managing somebody else's money, it was not in your best interest necessarily to be involved in crypto. And that start that narrative is starting to change. But I think the bigger question is, that is part of a bigger wave of people entering the space. And how will those people want to trade? These aren't people that have been in crypto since 2013, 2014. They're probably not all that comfortable holding crypto itself, which is why futures are a particularly interesting product. And, and I think uh, especially if you can margin them in fiat. Mm. Um, okay. And, and is that because, you know, it, it's kind of like um, having that, that liability of if you have to manage other people's money, you don't want to take that risk of going into something that that volatile and and maybe futures because of the fact that you know th they're in a more regulated market um money managers can 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 say you know this is kind of a, a legit product to to put your investment in um well they're kind of two separate things so there's a lot of career risk up until this last week or two of saying that you want to invest in cryptocurrency if you made the investment and the investment performed very well and you're a fund manager you might get a bigger bonus but if you make the investment in bitcoin has some catastrophe, you're, you're basically fired. So there's relatively limited upside and there's extreme downside in making that risk up until very recently. Um, the reason that the new um, wave of people entering the space are likely to want to trade um, fiat margin futures is because there is quite a lot of risk in carrying crypto relative to having dollars in a bank account. Um, and for people that just want to trade the price or get exposure to the price, uh, they might not want to go hold crypto in and of itself. And that's, I think, what um, Mr. Tudor or Paul Tudor Jones did is he he's trading futures. And please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'll, jump, I'll jump in here. Um, you, you know, I, I guess earlier today, you guys might have seen the news that Eris X, another cryptocurrency exchange, announced that they're uh, going to start trading CFTC regulated Ether futures. <sighs> And uh, maybe go to Tim for this one. Is that something that we would expect to see uh, from the CME? Is that something that you guys are working on? Hey, Brad. Yeah, I mean, you saw the announcement today. You know, it's always great to see new product development uh, from other exchanges in the space. And certainly we welcome the additional uh, evolution in the regulated venue space. Uh, it's always great to see that innovation and that product development. Uh, but, you know, at CME, we don't comment on our future product pipeline. Uh, I think one thing to note, though, is we have had the Ether U.S. dollar reference rate out there uh, on our five that amalgamates the prices of the transactions from the same five consistent exchanges, uh, you know, being Bitstamp, ItBit, uh, Coinbase, uh, Kraken, and Gemini. Uh, so we've had a, that's been out there about two years now. We actually announced that two years ago a consensus when it wasn't virtual. Uh, so we're still looking at the Ether space. You know, we're still excited to promote the transparency of the pricing and the benchmark. Uh, but in terms of product pipeline, you know, Bitcoin futures and certainly Bitcoin options are keeping us busy, uh, but certainly be interesting to watch uh, the development at, at RSX given their announcement today. Maybe, Sam, to turn to you, just, you know, obviously this sort of highlights 
uh, the competitive dynamic in this industry, which is super, super fascinating, you know, compared with traditional financial markets, Wall Street, where there's just, you know, a few big exchanges that kind of have all of the consolidated markets. And in this, in crypto, you know, it seems like people are really fighting for market share in this growing market. I'm curious, what now what about the ether market for you? Is that, what, what does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, we at FTX, we have, we have ether futures, we also have ether spot, not surprisingly, it's our second most actively traded product after the Bitcoin futures. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's true for a lot of places. Uh, there's sort of an interesting history here, if you look at volume patterns across exchanges, um, which is that for a while, Ether was actually, in the, in the States, it was always the second biggest uh, crypto, but but internationally, that was not always true. And, and we went through periods where EOS and sometimes even XRP had more uh, volume, more trading interest, more open interest, more pricing impact, and, and sort of more activity in every definition of the world, uh, word globally. Um, you know, there there are days when EOS features are trading five billion dollars um, globally, and I, you know, I I think over time those have died down a little bit with respect to ETH, and ETH has sort of cemented itself as the second biggest uh, coin in crypto globally. Um, but you know, we've seen a lot of interest in our ETH futures. I think we've tended to have uh, close to the highest open interest uh, in in the world in ETH. Um, and uh, you know, it hasn't been what people have been trading for the last uh, you know last month. Like the last month has really been mostly about Bitcoin because uh, this is the Bitcoin having, not not the crypto having. And, and you know, I would expect ETH interest to pick up. As you know, having talk dies down and, and ETH 2.0 talk uh, picks up to some extent. Um, but you know, these things definitely go through phases. And, and and you know, one thing I will say is that I think ETH is is at this point a pretty good proxy for everything. But, but you know, for, for like the world X Bitcoin, when you're talking about price action, this isn't always true. Uh, but I think it's you know more true than it used to be. I'm super interesting to to hear you say that um, Ether is cementing itself as the second biggest. Uh, crypto af after Bitcoin outside of the U.S. too. Um, and, and Kevin, uh, was wondering at, at Kraken Futures, you also offer Ether Futures outside of the U.S., is that right? Yes, we do. So we do Bitcoin, Ethereum, Bitcoin Cash, Ripple, and Litecoin, all with up to 50x leverage. We do perpetuals monthly and quarterly for all of them. And so how what, what kind of activity are, are you seeing there? Are you seeing something similar to what Sam uh, told us about? Yeah, absolutely. So much as he he said, um, Bitcoin is, is definitely the king of the industry right now in terms of volume, in terms of interest. Um, Ethereum is, is second for us as well, um, and it follows a lot of the same patterns. There's quite a steep drop off after Ethereum in terms of interest from clients, as well as trading volumes. Would it make sense to you um, if, if, you know, if, if these are the two biggest uh, cryptos traded by volume? I mean, does it... Would you expect to see, would you want to see um, uh, Ether, you know, regulated futures contract in, in the U.S.? Do you think it, the market is ready for it? Are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we already offer a regulated Ethereum futures contract, uh, just ex-U.S. Um, Tim could probably speak to the U.S. specifically. Right, right. No, I was saying, you know, since... Based on your experience with Ether futures outside of the U.S., if it's something that you think that the U.S.'s market could be ready for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so launching futures in the U.S. is is a top priority for the exchange. It's um, by far sort of the biggest single market um, that we've seen. Mm -hmm. So it is a steep climb to do that in a proper regulated way. Um, as we've done it in the European markets and, and elsewhere. So we're going to try uh, to do that, but it will take some time to launch regulated Ethereum futures for us in the U.S. Thanks. And uh, Tim, just I think we're going to have to end it on this last question, but I'm curious, you know, again, talking about all this competition uh, and maybe just real quick, 30 seconds, um, what do you think about the size of this pie? I mean, what is your what is your view of kind of the overall growth of growth potential of this market? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think over the, the last few years, you know, we've seen the pie continue to grow and kind of pulling some of the threads together. It's about customer demand, increasing the risk management capabilities of the space and the listed and regulated venues. And when we see kind of this institutional wave happening that we were talking about briefly, I mean, there's only more to come, I think, from our perspective, as more clients continue to embrace the product and, and embrace the notions around risk management of crypto and looking at the regulated space on both futures and options to meet those risk management needs and to access the market uh, that works for them. I think there's plenty of, of growth still to be had, and it's encouraging not only to see what, what others are doing on this panel and doing at this conference, but I think when listening to customers the last few uh, months and years, it's been exciting to see their needs have continued to evolve, and I'm excited to see what we'll be talking about next year at Consensus, uh, hopefully in person. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you. I, I want to thank all of you. You know, I wish I, we could keep you guys for another 30, 42 hours. Uh, we have such a good cross section of different types of exchanges here. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.